So um, the actual rig of the plane, of course, uh, consists of a few parts scattered around the Maya file. And the, the part of the rig that you will use as an animator and that a uh, technical artist will have prepared for you on production um, is usually the, the, the controls group. So that's a bunch of objects you can use to select parts of an asset, to animate them, to move those controls around, uh, to bring life into um, your asset, in this case into our plane. And these controls will usually be hooked up um, to all of these geometry parts uh, up here. Um, those controls will have uh, sliders, um, attributes that you um, mo can modify. They might be controls which you can um, select and rotate or translate and they will directly influence uh, an object. Um, the rig will also contain um, um, deformers or um, any kind of, 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 of history uh, in Maya really that uh, might maybe um, deforms um, objects like the wings here um, or something like that. So that's all part of the rig. So um, the, the hidden side of the rig is basically hidden uh, in the node editor here and we'll take a look at that a little bit later. But there's just a bunch of nodes that are connected to other nodes that are, um, well, um, making connections between objects and building relationships on uh, uh, on what influences what and how. Um, so as I said, the visible part is the part that we've hidden before because we didn't want to see it while taking a look at the uh, geometry of our object. So I'm going to go to show, show controllers. And this is going to make all of our controllers visible again. And I'm going to quickly go over that now. So what you can see are a bunch of NURBS curves in the viewport, um, like these or uh, this. And every single one of them can be selected and is responsible for um, transforming a part of the plane or for modifying a part of the plane for, for animation. Um, the very first thing that you will notice is um, I've set up the controls in a way that when you scrub the timeline or when you press play on the timeline, um, they are automatically going to be hidden. So that's the thing you can actually set up on, on, on any object in, in, uh, in Maya, really. So uh, every object, either on its shape or its transform, has this option to hide on playback. And in this case, this is actually uh, set on the uh, the top group of the controls hierarchy. So this is, has hide on playback turned on. So whenever I scrub through the timeline and I actually want to see my shot or um, or um, want to evaluate my shot uh, by doing a play blast, so just going here to the timeline and, and basically render out a a video of uh, what I'm currently seeing in the viewport. Um, my shot is not obstructed by all those control objects because, well, of course, they, they, they clutter you view of the actual object. But in the end, you, you, you have to manipulate a lot of things on an object. So um, you need basically easy controls for that because you don't want to go, go in here and animate any single surface of those wheels um, or the gear assembly to, to move the gear down or something like that. You, of course, want to have convenient controls as an animator because what you want to tell Maya is uh, move the gear down, but not uh, take this surface, rotate it 20 degrees, um, take this surf surface, rotate it 10 degrees, uh, move this uh, 20 units to, to the right or to the left or, or whatever. Um, so you kind of want to control things intuitively and that's what uh, control objects are for. So if I expand this P51D controls group, um, you can see uh, that while this, this hierarchy does not mimic exactly the, the hierarchy that is um, our actual plane's geometry, um, there is a co correlation between each, between each and any one of these objects and these objects. So um, that, for example, the flap control um, is going to control um, the extension of the landing flaps on, and something like that. So um, we're going to go into this a little bit later. Um, 
So every control rig usually has a master SRT or basically just the the the, um, the origin of the object, uh, which can be transformed as a whole to position it in your scene. So in this case, it's this uh, yellowish greenish uh, controller right here. Um, for um, some reasons I will explain later, this is always uh, uh, also going to indicate the runway direction right here. Um, so if you have your plane um, taking off or landing in your shot, um, this is how you want to have it oriented. Um, you could have this um, be uh, free in the scene. There are some reasons why I kept it that, that way. Uh, but anyway, um, if you select this, this thing, you can transform the whole plane group and move it about, po um, position it wherever you want. Um, you can take the plane itself and just move it um, through through space you, you, you can see that the the, the this group um, which are controls for the interaction uh, with the ground is moving with it uh, of course you can take it and, and just rotate it and um, things like that so um, yeah that's basically what controls are for and before diving deeper into um, uh, how things can be animated with controls and what kind of controls are actually there on the P51 model. Um, I want to give a quick introduction into um, what controls are, how they are built and how they are connected to other objects because this is kind of like the basis of uh, working with the node editor or uh, driven keys which is a concept where you can uh, build um, connections and correlations between objects uh, through animation curves. So where you basically animate an object not based on, on the time and the timeline, but the value of another object. And to demonstrate that, I'm just going to, again, because I closed it, again, uh, fire up the second uh, Maya instance and I'll be back in a second. So let's get started with a very simple, very first control. So I'm just going to create a standard polygon cube here. And we want to influence this cube with another object and don't want to see the human IK here. Um, let's say we create a new... Uh, what do we want to create? We want to create a... Why are they not... There, there they are. Um, so let's say we want to create a circle. Just a simple thing. I, I, for, for some reason, I'm used to creating nurse curves from, from the shelf. I don't know why I seldomly use the shelf and I'm used to using um, the shift click menus in the viewport uh, because actually you don't need to see the shelf. So, so while modeling, I sometimes leave open the polygon shelf because uh, I, I kind of liked it spots of orange color up here in the top. Uh, I know it's ridiculous, uh, but for this demonstration or for uh, any kind of productive workflow, really, I'm just going to hide everything in the interface that I don't need to see. Um, so that's, um, that's a simple NURB circle. So that's just a curve, um, which doesn't get rendered, which is uh, just a spline. Um, so it doesn't have any thickness or anything like that. And uh, usually you use them in combination with nerves modeling, but you can easily use them as control objects. So um, this is a very simple thing. As you can see, you can't see much of that circle because my background color is pretty dark. I like to work that way. Um, the standard color uh, is dark blue. So the very first thing you might want to change is uh, the object's color so that you can actually see that and you can do that for any object really. Uh, so if I go down to the shape um, or even the transform, it doesn't matter, matter really. Um, or, well, first of all, I can, um, what I did in the other scene, I can set the outliner color here. So for example, if my want to be, my controls to be bright red or something like that, or well, let's say not that bright. Um, I can do that. So let me just quickly rename the thing here. That's control and our cube is the object to be controlled. Uh, I'd never think name things that way usually, but yeah, 
that kind of works for now. So our circle is still not very much visible. So I can go to drawing overrides. I can enable the override so I can change a bunch of, of things here. Um, how my displays stuff. I could turn off shading uh, for, for polygon objects. So I just see the wireframe or things like like that. But anyway, um, what I want to change is the color of the object in the viewport. And I want to switch from index to RGB. I'm ju just going to set my my color and for maybe I'd like to to have the same color as I've uh, given the outliner. Uh, you usually won't. Uh, all your controls might be color coded so you can distinguish between certain things or you're just gonna make it look nice really because there's, there's uh, uh, while you can use uh, any kind of system you like you'll uh, soon uh, soon notice there are way too few colors in the real world to really distinguish between uh, certain functions and um, you border on the realm where you choose colors that you can't distinguish from one another anyway. So yeah, uh, it's often kind of arbitrary and um, you just use what you are used to and hope people will, will figure it out or at least assume there's a system even as there, if there's really none. Um, I'm kidding here, of course, there are systems. Um, okay, so um, let's say I, uh, I uh, have uh, colored my circle, um, or maybe I want to use some yellow, I liked it better. So um, the next thing you might want to set up because the, the, the circle is pretty, uh, pretty, pretty uh, thin, uh, you might want to make it more visible. You can go on the shape to extra attributes. There's actually a hidden option there. So um, the line width is set to minus one. So let's just use the default, whatever is set in Maya. If you put it to one, it's the default. So it's gonna stay the same. If you put it to two or 1.5 or any number really, um, you can make the line thicker. I usually use something between one and two, four, four controls. I like them, don't like them to be too thick. But as you can see, um, that's much more visible. Um, I'm going to hide the grid here um, just to make it even more obvious. So that's that. That's our first control object. Uh, I can delete history on it or for anything in the scene really because, uh, yeah, we don't want construction history um, while rigging. So, yeah, if I move that circle, nothing's going to happen. And we want to build a relationship between our cube and that circle. So I'm going to go into the node editor here. And I really gonna do the simplest, uh, simplest relationship I can. So I can select both objects, and I can just press in and output connections here, um, which is gonna give me a bunch of nodes. Um, I can also drag in the objects just from the outline with a middle mouse button click. Maya will by default um, add shapes and stuff you don't need to see wire rigging, at least most often you don't see, need to see wire rigging uh, to the node editor. Um, you can turn it off or you can just go uh, into, uh, into the, the node editor and just, let me make this thing a little bit clearer here. Um, you can just go into the node editor and you can hide things that you don't want to see. Um, don't press delete on the keyboard. You will delete the objects. There's this minus button here. Use that. Um, so um, we have our object to be controlled here and our control object here. And if I expand um, their nodes, you can see that I have access to basically all the attributes that an object has. So there's a bunch of more actually. Um, you can always access them via this menu. So you can have pretty much access to any and all attributes there are on a object in Maya. Not only objects, it's for shapes, uh, uh, deformers, what, whatever it is. Every object is a node in Maya, even though it might not be that obvious uh, initially. Mm. So the very simple connection I can create is just um, I can connect the translate of my control to my object to be controlled. And if I've done that, um, I can move about the circle and the cube is going to follow. Uh, obviously, I can still rotate the cube because as you, as you see, while the translate input is uh, connected to something and can, can't manipulate this because it's overridden by our control object, I can still rotate the thing. So I can go here and move the thing, this, this thing about and maybe still rotate my cube to my liking. Um, 
Of course, I can just connect straight up the rotation as well. So now if I rotate my circle, the cube is also going to follow. And I can move them about. And that's that. And if you re really run to, as I said, you, you just seldomly need to animate any scales unless it's a maybe a cartoon rig where you have uh, stretchy legs or something like that. There's seldomly a reason to scale things uh, in any 3D application, really. Um, if you need to scale things, you're probably modeled to a wrong uh, to wrong measurements and you should fix that before starting to rig. Um, so you basically decide whether your scene units are meters, centimeters or or whatever. Uh, depends on the thing you're, you're creating really. So anyway, um, I can hook up the scale and if I do that I can could also scale my cube along with my little spline here. And I'm just gonna move things back to the origin here. So that works well, um, if things are at the same position initially, um, if I move the cube somewhere else and then make the connection, you can see the, the cube will move back uh, to the position of the control because obviously I've directly connected the value, translate x, y, z, um, of my control to uh, the object to be controlled. Um, I could also just use the, the translate y, for example, so whenever I move my circle in the y direction the cube is going to follow but it's not going to follow if i move on any of the other axes um you can do that so really seldomly needed that way but but you can but that doesn't give me any um freedom uh to to move my object about with that circle if it's moved off to the side and let's say i want to have my cube right here and this is its control and then i want this this um offset to remain the same, uh, I can't do that. So if I go to translate and hook it up, it's it's not, not going to do that. So there's a few concepts um, in Maya that you can use to control objects that way. Um, the, the older way is to use constraints. So when I go to the rigging menu set here and go to constraints, you can see there's a bunch of constraints like parent constraint, point, orient, etc. etc. Um, but there is also this new way, which I'll quickly go into. And as I mentioned before, that's a transform offset parent matrix, which is very, very handy. And I'm kind of surprised it took that long for, for Maya to implement such a function. Of course, you could al always, you can do anything um, you can do with transform offset parent matrix before by just using some simple matrix and ve vector math in the node editor. But obviously you don't want to have a bunch of nodes for something simple. So transform offset parent matrix is actually able to build a parent relationship with another object for any object really. You gotta be careful about frozen transforms and some local offsets. Um, but in the end, um, this is uh, a pretty nice handy tool, um, which isn't really available in any other package actually in, in, in that easy way. But whatever, um, we can use that. So let's use that. So if I uh, take my control circle, um, the control circle has something like a world matrix, which uh, for any intents and purposes um, uh, for, for this video is just this translate rotate scale in the world. It, basically describing where the object is and uh, what its rotation is. And you can take that and use that as an offset for the object to be controlled. So if I go in here and take the world matrix and it's actually an array attribute, so I'm gonna take the world matrix zero and um, I'm gonna connect it up to this white uh, circle here because you can see in the standard list of, of attributes, the um, transform offset parent matrix is not exposed. So I'm gonna go in here, select other, and I'm gonna be presented with all the attributes that can be hooked up. So because this is a matrix attribute, um, there's basically just only another one, single one, and that's offset parent matrix. And I'm gonna connect that those two, and you can see that's just a simple line. But if I now take my circle and I move it about, you will see that the cube will transform relative to the position of that circle. If I rotate the circle, um, the cube will stay where it is. If I scale the circle, it will also stay where it is. So basically, that's a handy replacement 
for um, the older ways to um, build um, kind of like um, parent or positional relationships to objects. You could of always, of course, decompose that matrix and just use its uh, translate um, values um, or anything like that. Um, but yeah, that's the, since this is just a quick overview, um, that's how you can do it uh, in Maya 2020. Um, it doesn't exist in versions before. Um, before, um, as an easy way to not go into matrix math, um, you had a concept that's called uh, a, um, a constraints. So if I had a node editor here, because the constraint is going to mess up my node layout, seriously. Um, let me show you. So constraints in Maya are built by selecting objects in the right order. And the order is actually confusing um, because in this case for a parent constraint, you select the parent first and then the object to be controlled. And as I said, in the rigging menu set, you go to create parent. This is going to build the parent constraint. You can click the option box and uh, take a look at the options. You can change some of this later because the uh, constraint will be in the attribute editor and you might want to change some options. Um, the thing here is maintain offset. So if I leave maintain offset on, I'm going to click apply. Uh, you can see that something changed in the outliner. And that is uh, basically this, this relationship is constrained, although it is not really uh, parented to, um, to that object, um, is visible in the outliner. So that can be uh, advantages uh, if you're new maybe to, 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 to Maya or any kind of 3D software because uh, it's there, you can see it. You can see that something is controlling your object because um, if you don't have that much experience in, in, in rig rigging, um, you probably don't uh, think about uh, opening the node editor at first and just gra graphing your, your object input and see what's there, what's controlling what. Uh, of course, you can always see that inputs are uh, connected to something because they are color coded in Maya. So this is a blue for a constraint. It's red for uh, animation keys. It's uh, yellow for some connections. So there's a system where you can see that at least that something is bound to something, but it, it can be a bit uh, complex um, um, compared to something like Houdini, where you always have a good overview of your node flow, but there are, there are advantages for, for both workflows. And that kind of like mix that Meyer is doing is actually quite, quite comfortable for for something like Rigidon, whereas the, the Houdini concept is definitely way, way better for any kind of dynamic simulation, really, or runtime geometry manipulation. So there's nothing that beats Houdini in that, uh, which is why I like to use it a lot of times. But there's a lot of things you can do in Meyer, and if you don't need to switch packages or basically use the power of Houdini for something that might be achieved a little bit easier uh, in your package or in Maya, how um, there's really no no reason to um, to go the more maybe more complicated way. Houdini isn't really that complicated. Um, it's just different. Um, so yeah, uh, a little tangent again. So I'm just gonna select my circle. I'm gonna move it around, and as you can see, everything is gonna follow. The one thing I can't move, although it appears this way, is uh, that I can move my, my cube and I can maybe leave it where it is. I can't. So it's going to snap back to its constrained position the moment I'm going to change it. Um, you, you can change that later, actually, but I recommend you don't. So be sure uh, or, or just break the constraint if you don't want to have it. In this case, we don't want to have it. I want to show a bunch of other little simple things here um, to give you a better understanding when taking a look at the P51 rig and the node editor, how things are set up. And I'm going to go back into the node editor or, or maybe before doing so, um, because I have been talking about constraints just to show you the kind of thing that happens when you build a constraint. Um, it's a tangled mess. So 
of course they those connections are actually pretty much needed and it's there's a reason why it is that way um, but it's confusing you can see that there are connections back um, there are cyclic connections so Maya can have cycling connections and there are a lot a lot a lot lots of cycles that are actually benign so they are cycles that are absolutely okay if you're coming from a a computer science background maybe um, you will know that cycles uh, should be avoided um, at all costs um, they might lead to infinite loops and something like that uh, but there are cycles that are okay so um, if a node is influencing a input of a node upstream um, that in turn doesn't influence um, the other node's output, which it is feeding back to, to the upstream node. Um, that's a benign cycle, so that, that can be done. And you can see um, those connections right here. They're going kind of like turn back onto a node upstream. Um, and, and the node is again connected downstream. But uh, in the end, if you are creating node uh, graphs, which is sometimes called nodaling instead of modeling, um, you never know what to do with them. You move them somewhere and they will look okay. You move them somewhere else and you go, oh, yeah, it's, it's okay, but there's a bunch of lines. Uh, they will cross everywhere. Um, it's not that nice and not that obvious how the data flows. Uh, the same goes for expressions in Maya, actually. There are nodes as well, so they might have a bunch of connections. They are useful um, and you should use them, but it's, it's really um, not that comfortable to work with them. So if there's an easier way, a more direct connection and, and even a faster connection, because those constraints are not well, they are fast. You know, don't notice them. You don't notice any performance impact, but there are more direct ways and in that way, more more efficient ways to connect things. So yeah, I do recommend using constraints if you're just starting out because they're easy to use. There's, it's obvious what they're doing. You can see them in the outliner. If you want to go into technical rigging, which I know a lot of you probably won't, um, because you want to animate or model or something like that, but, but this is an overview of the of the whole process uh, of the whole pipelining of that asset, uh, at least in a very um, simple way. Um, if you want to go into rigging and if you're interested in that, um, try to avoid constraints at some point. Um, they're messy. So um, whatever. Um, as I said, you can use them. Um, but uh, there are ways to, to uh, make things a lot easier. So I'm just gonna kill that thing here. Uh, I don't need it. Um, a very simple last thing or second to last thing I want to show uh, quickly is of course uh, I just built a connection um, again. So I'm gonna take the translate Y and connect it to the translate Y of our object to be controlled. You can see the cube is staying where it is. Of course, it's just moving with the circle in the Y direction. I can rotate this thing and nothing, nothing's gonna happen. Um, those connections, of course, can be modified along the way. So if I go in here and maybe just create a float math node, uh, which can do some basic math. So it's add, subtract, multiply, whatever you need really. So there's not much more mathematical function uh, and a day, daily basis that you actually need while, while doing things. Um, so if I go in here and this translate Y is gonna be my trend, um, input uh, A of the float math. And I'm gonna name this control float math uh, because it's good to name things. I don't usually name name some uh, some uh, in between nodes, so it's gonna stay float math one two three whatever. I do name some nodes, and really you should name every node, and you would do that on larger productions. But really, there's often not a lot of time to do things. Some things are moving pretty quickly in production, so you can kind of get away with not naming some things, but I don't recommend it because, well, you, if it's just float math one, you don't have any idea um, what that node that actually does. So um, whatever, um, I'm gonna create a second connection here and um, connect the outflow to the trans translate wire. You will have seen that the cube um, just moved 
a bit. And it moved because um, this float map is currently set to add and its second input, which is um, which you can influence here, is set to one. So I just added one to the Y position of our control circle. So now if I move the circle, um, the cube is always gonna stay one unit ahead. If I set that to three, the cube is gonna stay three units ahead. If I multiply that by, by zero, the cube is never gonna move anywhere. Um, if I take that float marf, uh, multiply it by one, it's gonna follow the circle as before. Um, and if I set that to two, maybe I'm just doubling the input of the circle. So the move is the cube is gonna move away from uh, from the, the circle. You you, you seldomly need, need, never actually need to build a simple connection like that. But it's about principle, so that's how you kind of like. Um, do some math between um, inputs, and that's very handy. Um, uh, the very last thing, or one of the last things I want to show is how to maybe make your controller a little more advanced. So that's, I'm gonna build some pretty unuseful things here, but it shows the concept. So this control object, it has a channel box. And you can see the attributes that you can animate on that thing, and that's okay. Um, maybe you don't want to animate everything. So in this case, I pr probably only want to animate it on, on the y-axis. So I can log and hide selected things. So I'm gonna go in here and just log and hide everything else. And basically what I did, I, I can't move that thing on any other axis than the y-axis and uh, my cube is gonna be controlled by, by that thing. So let me just quickly set this back to, to add here and I'm just gonna add one and uh, that's that. So I'm gonna move the cube up and down. So let's say I want to have some control over that offset. So um, a control might not only have its own transform attributes, but it might also uh, expose custom attributes where you can uh, control additional parameters. So if I select my control thing here and go to add attributes, there's this um, handy little window and I'm just gonna add a new attribute and I'm gonna call it offset. And it's a float attribute and let's say I want to, to um, have a slider in, in, in the view and I'm gonna set the offset to minus three to three. So I can offset the cube plus three units from the circle or minus three units from the circle. So I'm just gonna add this, this thing. You can see that the offset actually appeared in my node, so it's there, I can access it. It's on extra attributes uh, in the attribute editor. And since it's keyable by default, it's actually also available in the channel box. And you can see that's pretty obvious um, what can be animated on that controller. So the very last thing I have to do, I have to, uh, hook up this offset, I'm gonna, instead of using the built-in float B um, value, I'm gonna hook it up to the float map node and it's currently set to zero. So um, the cube is gonna move with my circle, but I can change that offset. So I will still um, move my circle about um, and I can keyframe the offset if I really wanted to um, or something like that. As I said, this is <laughs> kind of like an impractical example, but it's simple and it gets the point, point across. So um, yeah, that's basically how you work with custom attributes, um, with control objects and things like that. Um, I'm not gonna go into how to build your actual cons control objects. You can do a lot with splines. Um, you can combine a few splines to one shape. So even if you have a bunch of splines that are building a control object, you can uh, parent them to the same transform. So what, whichever shape you select, you're always gonna select the same object. Um, if you want to know more about that, just, just um, look for parent RS in the, uh, in the documentation, it's a mail command, and uh, you will find what you're looking for. Uh, so, um, having said that, I'm going to save this file, actually, because we might need it later, because there's a bunch of stuff um, I should probably show uh, regarding driven keys. So, let me sa save that as control, example, 
e01.mb and there it is and I don't want to see this nose Maya um, anyway um, saved it gonna close it and let's move back to our p51d so back in our um, p51 file um, let's um, take apart some of the things here and see how, what they are controlling and later on how uh, the very first thing is um, while rigging I usually like to um, to animate a few things because really you need to to check if your math is working if uh, everything is really controlling things the way they should uh, you should see if something breaks for example whatever if you take that plane and uh, rotate it into a uh, really crazy position uh, if something breaks and actually there is something breaking right now so as you can see that uh, tire is gonna um, pretty much uh, get deformed in a crazy way the reason for that is uh, the rig is not set up to have the plane crash that way into the ground so um, you could do that and definitely for destruction shots or something like that um, you build things differently anyway so there'd be a whole lot of simulation involved if that plane is going to crash into the ground in, in, in that way and uh, to be honest actually um, if uh, you'd want to do that you'd probably take the whole plane I would uh, take the whole plane um, write it out, um, import it into Houdini, um, make some convex hulls from it uh, so that it's not a bunch of uh, open surfaces, um, break it up and just have it deform when impacting the ground and add a little smoke sim, or a big smoke sim rather. I guess the smoke plume is pretty big if that thing is gonna crash. Um, anyway, um, I'm kind of like doing something that the rig is not meant to do. Um, you can always build uh, in um, constraints so that you can't do some things. In that case, I really don't need to. So uh, as soon as the plane is above the ground in this orientation, everything is fine. And uh, uh, basically, I'm not going to do that. If I'm um, on that... Uh, Near the ground, the, the, the plane is gonna land uh, pretty much uh, without problems, uh, or it should. So, uh, the, the maximum uh, rotation I might have is probably this because a lot of planes tend to uh, touch the ground with one wheel first, um, I guess, depending on the pilot. Um, so, yeah, um, you are not supposed uh, to, to do that. But, um, as I said, taking a look at the capabilities of the rig, um, one of the first things, and let me just reset that here back to its original position, uh, there's one thing that is pretty hand handy, maybe, um, if you take a look at it. Um, the rig is built in a way that whenever you zero out uh, values, everything is going to reset, um, be reset the way that the file was when you first opened it. So usually that's pretty important because uh, zeroing out values usually means um, that you go back to um, the the asset's original state, um, which you might keep also on frame zero if um, you're animating. So if you're animating shots, <coughs> you'd uh, usually have your frame zero because you're animating on from one onwards, really. Um, actually, you don't. Um, so... If you this this was an actual shot, you'd probably have a hundred frames or even a thousand frames or whatever your supervisor tells you or whatever the production decided on, or uh, whatever length of frame handles you need at the beginning and the end. You'd start your animation later because if the shot is. Um, if the editor decides to cut into the shot a little bit earlier and you're getting the new plate and you need to um, kind of like um, add some animation to uh, to your original file at the front, um, there's really no convenient way to do that if your animation is beginning on frame one or zero because you're dealing with negative frames in that case. So usually in frame production, there is not much of a concept of negative frames. 
and you do want to avoid them, you can use them actually, and you might use them for some kinds of, of pre-runs, but really that just leads to problems. So um, yeah, I'd recommend always starting at least on a frame 100, uh, so you do have four seconds, about four seconds of pre-run um, to, to maybe correct a few things or set a few things up. So actually it's sometimes quite handy to have a hundred frames to, to um, yeah, kind of like keep experimenting with Windows. So, um, as I said, but this starts at frame zero, this is just a test file. Um, so the first thing you saw, I'm going to go back to frame zero because I need to reset the propeller and I'm going to explain why a little bit later. Um, what I did in this file, so taking a look at this, I did some little uh, example animation. I'm just going to let it run uh, for a second here. And you can see that the propeller starts, the wings are beginning to flex because um, there are forces acting on the plane. Um, the canopy, canopy is closing, the flaps are moving to the upward position because the plane is going to start with flaps up, so the flaps are for landing. Um, the wheels are rotating while the plane moves and it's going to start and I actually set up a, a camera uh, within the rig group uh, so that camera is actually parented to this uh, this ground controller here so um, let me hide the channel box here really quickly and we don't need that much of a large outliner um, so the camera is parented to this ground and this ground has a few little handy features or at least features I, I liked to, to implement for, for this because I kind of like wanted to quickly put through some some three demo shots and this this um, this um, this test shot. So the camera is parented to the ground and it's gonna wobble a little bit because there's some noise um, that can be activated within the rig to make things a little bit more natural, which can be controlled on, on the control objects. So let me just quickly run this through. So because the plane can't fly without its pilot, let me just quickly unhide the pilot here. And uh, that's it. Let's just press play and see what happens. So as you can see, the flaps again are moving up, the propeller is starting to rotate. Um, as soon as, as the plane starts to move, you will see that there's some auto wheel rotation implemented. So depending on its position, the wheels are gonna rotate automatically and they are animated to actually stop rotating once the plane has left the ground. You can see it moving up and you can see here is some wheel deformation for the ground. Um, so this is kind of pushed to the extreme in this case. So usually the tires would have a little bit more pressure, but you can control that on the rig. So I pushed it to its extreme position because you usually want to be able to. Um, but as you can see, that's, that's kind of like a low pressure tire. So you can definitely reduce that, but that's what your controls are for. You can decide per shot how much deformation um, you want to apply to the wheels. Um, let me quickly hide... Uh, the attribute editor here. Um, yeah, and that's that. And everything you can see here is animated with the control of objects. I didn't touch a single thing on the actual geometry or within the actual hierarchy, which is how it should be because those things tend to be really, really confusing. And you really don't need to dig through, um, through the objects or you shouldn't uh, have to, um, to animate uh, some, some things. So, um, Going back into our perspective cam here, um, there's a bunch of other cameras, as I said. Um, actually, I should rename that, that shot cam on ground because it's part of the asset. So it's currently P51D shot cam on ground. And uh, mm, there's this wheel cam. I've, I've called it wheel cam. Could be any cam, really. It's, it's parented to, um, to the planes. Uh, master so um, I usually use that to check if everything uh, is moving correctly relative to the plane so if we let this run through and let the plane take off uh, you can see a few things here um, it's not that easy to move the camera while it's moving you can see that there's this little hydraulic line is actually deforming uh, with the plane sorry for that just moved off the camera it's 
it's pretty tricky with with uh, relative transforms in this case to um, get the camera to behave if you uh, move it while it's playing. Um, so yeah, let's just not do that. So you can see as soon as the plane takes off, the shock absorbers are um, basically extending and the hydraulic line is moving with it. So it's gonna get back in and uh, the gear is stowed safely. Um, so yeah, let's get back to the very first uh, frame here and let's leave the control camera. You could, you could also use the control camera to check if your flaps are moving correctly and something like that. One thing I don't have at the moment, but you could use the camera, I would rename that for that, is a camera that you keep on standby because um, if you take a look at the shot cam on the ground, if I wanted to animate the, the, the flap on the other side, actually they, they're moving in parallel, but if I wanted to select the flap control on the other side, it's currently blocked by um, by the uh, gear clamshell doors. So um, yeah, I I usually have a second camera, which I will have uh, in, a, in a second viewport, either as a split pane here or uh, moved off to the second monitor. That I just keep something uh, oriented something like this, and I can still move about, so that I always have easy access to um, to my control object. So I always have a camera where I can easily select the objects, and I don't have to leave my shot cam, um, so I can keep it. Um, keep it here and always see how things look in the shot because at the end um it all it's all about what your cam shot camera sees so nobody cares about the actual physical reality of things if it looks bad in your shot cam that is not to say you should animate things uh, like a plane to their physical capabilities but you're always pushing things in production after all vfx and film in general or even the kind of immersive story storytelling we're doing at the lab is all about faking things so nobody wants to see uh see a perfect um rendition of of reality so you usually kind of like push things to the more extreme than they might really be um so yeah you should you should base your things in physical reality so there has to be the correct weight to the plane you can't do sharp turns like a modern fighter jet so, so the p51d is actually a pretty maneuverable plane but it's still a uh a prop plane and it's old it's a world war ii fighter as i said so yeah um when animating take a look at the references so it's really important so especially um how fast the, the gear actually moves you can always push that later and decide nah that's gonna take too long for the shot we had to cut some time here and it's gonna be it has to be more energetic so the wheels have to be in in like three seconds but it might take 10 seconds in, in reality or something like that but uh, when animating it usually helps to look at references to know what the thing really does so having said that um we want to take a look at the rig controls so um i'm gonna save that file because as you can see i called it animated uh, I did animate a few things, but I don't want to have any keyframes right now um, because I want to show you um, how the rig works actually and keyframes are gonna interfere with that sometimes. So let me just select, so I'm gonna select the controls group here and just gonna select the hierarchy and everything that can be animated on this asset is within this group. There is no other thing that has to be animated. So whenever I select down the whole hierarchy of that thing, those are all the keyframes there are. You can't miss anything. So when I delete them, that's it. You're, you deleted your whole animation. So if I just select everything here down here, I'm gonna delete it. Um, that's that, we've got a clean asset. Nothing's moving. And uh, I would return um, to the animated file later probably because yeah really um there's some things you can only show with a few keyframes and i don't feel like animating again just for this example so i'm going to reload that file later but let's take a look uh what's there 